الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا والشفيع نفسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وآل محمد Like we know more than anything else, this month of Ramadan is an opportunity for us to know ourselves. And at the same time, we learn a little bit about God in the process. And others would say that this month is about knowing God, and we learn a little bit about ourselves in the process. And either way, going back toward that statement that is attributed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, which he states, the one who knows his self knows his Lord. And so through our efforts and through our focus and through our diligence during the course of the month of Ramadan, we get exposed to the reality of who we are. Not who we are physically, but who we are spiritually. And that path and that unveiling also helps aid us in terms of us fulfilling our knowledge or our quest for knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And within the whole of Quran, God, he introduces himself numerous times via his names and his attributes. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna فَدْعُوهُ biha. As I stated within the Quran, that God has the most beautiful of names. So call upon him by those names. And you'll see that at the end of many verses of the Quran, God concludes, إِنَّهُ السَّمِيءُ الْبَسِيرُ الرحمن الرحيم اللطيف الخبير And so on and so forth, which allow for us to get a little bit of a glimpse into who God is. The most merciful, the most generous, the all-knowledgeable, the all-hearing, the all-seeing, so on and so forth. And for us, it unveils a little bit more every time we read it and every time we contemplate upon those verses and every time that God introduces himself to us via his own names, again, we start to understand exactly who he, who he is with a little bit more clarity. And I want to share with you a couple of verses of the Quran whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces himself to us in the way that he wants to introduce himself to us and in the way that he commands the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam to introduce him to us. In chapter 15, for instance, verse 49 and 50, God states, ibadi anni rahim wa anna adabi adabul He says, O oh, Messenger, O oh, Muhammad, and tell them and proclaim to them and say to them, Say to who? Ibadi, my servants. And say to my servants, Anni anal rahim that surely I am the most forgiving and I'm the most merciful. And in another verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, Kataba Rabbuku ala nafsihir rahma annahu man amila minkum su'an bi jahalatan thumma taba min ba'dihi wa aslaha fa annahu ghafur rahim. He says that God has written for himself. He says, your Lord has written for himself that he is the most merciful. And like we know, we begin all of our rituals by the recitation of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in which we invoke God's name, his names of mercy and of compassion. So while this theme is consistently prevalent, within the way that God speaks about himself, within the verses of the Quran, within the life and the legacy and the teachings of our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, for whatever reason, we often fail to remember that or put it to the forefront. We understand or we picture this God who is a vengeful God, a God who is an angry God, a deity who is always looking to punish us, who is always looking for our faults, who is always looking to bring down legislation upon us, tell us what is permissible, tell us what is forbidden for no reason at all. And that's the way that so many people understand religion. That's the way that so many people understand God. And I know I say this often, I know my colleagues say this often, but everything about these gatherings 
The most important thing that we should strive to do is eradicate that perception that we have of who our creator is. Because once we break down that barrier, then there's opportunity for real growth. So we need to drive it home as often and as common as we possibly can because we need to dewire the way that we learn who God is, who our prophet is, and what our religion states about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, it starts with us understanding his mercy and his compassion. And for today's discussion, I want to take a look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and its various manifestations in three dimensions. The first is to understand, again, a little bit more with regards to how God introduces his own mercy. Secondly, to understand certain examples of how God shows his mercy to us on a day-to-day -day basis. And thirdly, how we can also be amongst those who illuminate the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Firstly, in chapter 7, verse 156, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسَأَتْ كُمْ That my mercy is that which encompasses all things. And in the famous dua of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, dua Qumay, which is recited on Thursday nights, we begin by reciting, Allahumma inni as'aluka barahmatika allati wasa'at kul mishay. Then, O oh Allah, O oh God, I am asking you by your mercy, which encompasses all things. What does it mean when we say that God's mercy, or what does it mean when God says that my mercy encompasses all things? We don't often see many a times why or where the mercy is with rainfall. In fact, we only get inconvenienced by rain. We have to carry an umbrella. There's no sun out. Less people come to the program. Ubers are more expensive. Trains are delayed a little bit more. We only see, again, through one lens, all of the inconveniences from our perception of the lack of God's mercy at this given moment. While there are, like we know, dozens, hundreds, thousands uh, of other creations of God that see the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala via this rain that falls down on a day like today. When we say, or when God says that my mercy encompasses all things, it means that at every single moment and every single opportunity that we have, in a gathering, in an, as an individual, whatever we have in terms of blessing in front of us, there is mercy in it, even be it a trial, even be it a tribulation, even be it a challenge, because again, he says, Rahmati wasit ala kul that my mercy encompasses all things. And there's no coincidence when God says something within the Quran. Again, we might not understand something. Be, uh, due to our lack of understanding, due to our ignorance. But what's, beauty, what what's really beautiful about this verse is, again, it demonstrates to us that it's all about us digging down a little bit deeper in order to contemplate, in order to find, in order to seek that mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in a hadith narrated by As-Saduq, rahimahullah, who narrates on the authority of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, alayhi salam, he states, Again, to demonstrate the mercy of God, he says, He says that on the day of judgment, God will distribute his mercy far and vast and wide. And one by one, inshallah, will be recipients of that mercy of God such that we are admitted into that paradise that we desire. It says, to the extent that even shaytan himself, even the Satan himself, the prime villain within the Quran, within our tradition, even he will think that he will be forgiven. Because again, of how God will distribute his mercy on that day. It said in a hadith that on that day of judgment, when God will be holding everyone to account, and determining who will receive punishment and who will be entered into paradise. That as everyone is being held to account, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he instructs his angels or he will instruct his angels to say 
that this person due to their sins and due to their lack of focus and due to their you know vices and so on and so forth should not be admitted to paradise so it is said that at this moment uh, the angels they come and they say sorry man we gotta take you to hell and he will be like scrambling away from these angels fighting screaming till he will wrestle himself away then he will look up to the throne of god and he will say oh my lord i didn't have this opinion of you i know you talk about you know punishment i know you talk about you know uh being held to account but i didn't really ever think that it was going to happen to me i i i, I was too reliant on your mercy I didn't, I didn't really believe that it was going to come down to this. And at that moment, the hadith, it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a call, which will state, that, oh, my servant, you're still my servant, but you're a liar. Then he will tell his angels, he says, but because he had a good opinion of me, take me to That's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the dua of Ali Zain al Abidin, dua of a Hamza al Damani, which is to be recited during the month of Ramadan, he says in his own personal supplication, in his moment of remembrance and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Ilahi ida ra'aitu durubi fazeptu wa ida ra'aitu karamaka tamatu. He says, Oh Allah, he said, when I take a look internally at myself, at my soul, at my sins, at my transgressions, at my deeds, I become fearful. I'm scared. I wonder, like, where is it that I'm going to end up? He says, but at that moment that I remember your mercy and your generosity and your grace, I forget everything about all of my transgressions, and I just become greedy. I become greedy for paradise. I become greedy for that mercy of yours. I become so motivated and inspired to be the best of your servants. When we introduce ourselves or reintroduce ourselves to our creator during the course of this month of Ramadan, it should be through this lens of understanding his mercy, his compassion, his grace, his beauty, and his love for his creation. And we should shouldn't be amongst those who say that I want to worship this God because I want something tangible. And we talked about this last night. Really, why wouldn't I want to be a servant of this God who is that kind and who is that merciful and who is that generous? In the famous lines of poetry of Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, he says, Ilahi kafa bi izzan an akuna laka abja, wa kafa bi fakhran an takuna li rabba. He says, Oh Allah, it is my honor that I'm able to consider myself and call myself your slave. Wa kafa bi fakhran an takuna li rabba. And it's my pride that I'm able to call you my Lord. Ilahi anta kama uhib, fajalni kama tuhib. Oh God, you are exactly the way that I love. Don't change. You're perfect. I love you the way that you are. Now, now make me that which you love. Allow for my dedication and my devotion and my remembrance of you to be something that is so transformative that I be that which you desire from me. And that brings me then to the second dimension of the discussion. Because in regards to some of these manifestations of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order, again, that we get a glimpse of who it is that we're communicating with during this month, who it is that we're seeking towards serving during this month and during these days and weeks. Firstly, and again, these are just a few, glimpses into the mercy of God, number one, God tells us that when we do a good deed, all good deeds are multiplied by 10, as, as mentioned within the Quran. That when you do a good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will multiply that good deed by 10. It's as if you did 10 good deeds. But when you perform a bad deed, God doesn't multiply it by 10, because then it would just be one to one, right? But he only multiplies it by one. And you think about it for just a moment. 
and you think about the way that we are as human beings in order to put it in some sort of perspective. When someone does something good to us, when someone does us a favor, when someone is kind, when someone does something polite, when someone gives us a gift, we'll often remember it, we'll internalize it, we'll show gratitude. But the minute that someone does something wrong to us, purposely or not purposely, regretfully or not regretfully, how often do we carry on that grudge? We carry it on forever. And it damages relationships and families, and communities and civilizations, right? This is the, 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 the law that unfortunately human beings are bound by. The good is this small, but the bad is this big, even if they don't even qualify in terms of being equals to one another. But the way that God sees us is very different. He says that that one small good deed that you did, I've multiplied it by 10. But that one bad deed, it was only one. Don't worry about it. We still are up nine points, so to say. And in a really beautiful hadith, it is stated in, uh, in narration, narrated by Zorara ibn A'yan, who narrates from Muhammad ibn Muslim, who narrates from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he states that these two companions, they go toward Imam al-Baqir, one of the great grandsons of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And he tells him, he says, what does it mean when God says this verse? Man ja'a bil hasana falahu ashru amtadaha. That the one who does a good deed, it gets multiplied by 10. Is the reason why God multiplies it by 10 is because we're just like really bad people, like human beings are pretty weak. I'll give you an example. You know when there's a class, right? When you, many of you, most of you are probably students, right? If most of the students don't do particularly well in a class, what does the professor do? They offer a curve, right? To sort of improve, right, on their perception and on your perception, what the average score is, you know? I don't understand why they don't just make the test a little bit easier, right? It doesn't make any sense to me, but that's, that, that's besides the point. There's a curve on an exam in order to raise up the general average, so over here, these companions, they're asking, and they're saying, is the reason why God multiplies all of our deeds, our, all of our good deeds by 10, is it because we're just all like pretty weak? And like, you know, none of us have really good scores at the end of the day. We're not gonna have a good report card for judgment day. To which he responds and he says, no, that's not the case. It's not because of the weakness of the believer, not at all. But rather he says, alayhi salatu wa salam, no, the reason why God multiplies your good deeds by 10 is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wants to give you more incentive. He wants to show you how merciful he is. He wants to show you that, look, I don't want your failure, but I want your success. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I cannot state this enough. He doesn't hate his creation. He did not put us through trials and tribulations and the difficulties that we go through during the course of life just solely so that he can trust us, so solely that he can test us, like people say. That is a reality to that. Tests and examinations and tribulations are intrinsic to man, intrinsic to the human being. And we will test you, God said, we will test you with challenges of wealth and finances and the loss of loved ones and whatever it may be, and give glad tidings to those who are patient. Undoubtedly, that's a reality. But he created us so that he can show mercy on us more than anything else. So one example of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the fact that he increases our good deeds by 10, but he only multiplies our bad deeds by one. A second example that he presents within the Quran or is mentioned within the Hadith is that God rewards us for a good intention, but doesn't hold us to account for a bad intention. I intend to do a good deed, but I don't do a good deed. I make an intention that I have an extra $5 in my pocket, when I get off the train, I'm going to give it to the first homeless person that I see before I walk to the building. You don't see any homeless people on the street because it's raining outside, for instance. 
that intention that you, and then you end up spending that $5 on coffee, for instance. But because you had that intention and you forgot that you saved that money for that cause, God says, don't worry, I'm going to give you the reward for supporting that homeless person, even though you didn't actually do it, just because you had that intention. But let's say you had the intention to, you know, do something not so appropriate. I had the intention to, you know, when I came into work today to punch Hannah in the face. And I made this intention that when I come into the office, the minute that I see Hannah, I will punch her in the face. Right? And I never deserved a punch ever. Sorry, Hannah. But I really had this intention. I was really hungry. I didn't have coffee this morning. It's a bad thing. But for whatever reason, I decided to hold my anger back. And I saw her and I said, no, how can I punch Hannah in the face? That's not a nice thing to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't hold me to account. He won't punish me for that. Because it was an intention that never materialized. You follow what I'm saying? Then you, when you make the intention to do something good, out of God's mercy, he rewards us. And out of God's grace, he doesn't punish us for those that we do work. Or those intentions that we have that are work. A third example. Third example is that the door like we know of repentance of God is always open. Like I said before, sometimes when we do wrong to somebody, it's so hard for them to ever forget. And sometimes that's understandable. It makes sense. But for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for our generous and compassionate and merciful God, he has said that this door is always open. And not only is the door always open, but he says in Allah, you have a tawabi. That I love those who repent. I love those who repent. Meaning you have to be someone who makes a mistake to be amongst those who repent. Meaning it's okay to make a mistake. And then it's okay to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the door of that mercy and of that compassion, it never ever closes. I'll give you an example from a hadith that is mentioned within our tradition. From the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, Man taba qabla mawtih bisana qubilallah tawbata. He says that for the believer, that when they repent a year before they die, God will forgive all of their sins. And then he says, inna sana la kathira. He says, no, a year is too much. He says that the one who asked for forgiveness a month before she or he dies, God will forgive that individual. And then he says, no. In the shahr, they can be. No, a month is too much. He says, then the one who asks for repentance on the Friday before she or he dies, God will forgive all of their sins. And then he says, no, no, no. That is too much. And then he says that the one who seeks forgiveness the day before she or he dies, God will forgive all of their sins and transgressions. And then he says, no, in Naoman the kathir. And then he says, the one who seeks forgiveness from God, the moment before their souls are removed from their body, God will forgive them. The door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and his compassion and his forgiveness is consistently open. And these are the days and these are the nights like we know where we have more of that potential to be recipients and we feel more inspired to communicate and seek from him and ask from him, understanding again, just how compassionate, just how merciful, just how caring, just how loving this God of ours is. We just ask everyone to just move a little bit forward so we're not blocking the entrance. But very, very quickly, uh, a couple of more quick examples. A fourth example of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that when we are going through any sort of pain and difficulty and hardship and challenge and tribulation during the course of our lives, we are told within our tradition, we are told within our ahadith, that that pain that you feel that anxiety that you feel, that stress that you have to encounter, 
even if it be on a day-to-day -day basis over something that might seem trivial to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala translates that to mercy in the realm beyond this one. You have a physical pain. You have a physical illness. You are going through financial difficulties. You lost a loved one. Whatever it may be, you have the stress of work and school and Ramadan, whatever it might be, the small or the big, the trivial and the massive, that every one of those challenges themselves are also a means by which God disseminates his mercy upon us. Pain equals mercy. Another example of the mercy of God is the fact that we can perform one good deed and we can consistently be rewarded for that and attain the benefits from that long, long, long after we perform that. Give you an example. You give someone some kind words of confidence. Someone is having a difficult day. You see that they're having a difficult day. You go to them and you say, my friend, what's going on? Are you doing all right? And they say, no, I'm just going through this problem, I'm going through that problem. And just by telling them something like, don't worry about it, you got this, I believe in you, you're going to do great. The fact that they got confidence, the fact that they felt better just by venting and from hearing your words of validation, the rest of their day and everything meaningful that they do on that day, you also share in that reward. But the good thing is that God's reward doesn't end, right? So it's not like all of a sudden you're sharing physically in a tangible reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When God gives you reward and he gives me reward and he gives, you know, your sister reward and he gives your brother reward and he gives your mom a reward and your dad a reward and your child a reward, it's not a limitation in God's bank account. When I give charity, I see a loss in my bank account physically. When I give out of myself, be it my time or my wealth, I can see something tangible leaving aside from the fact that the reward of it and the multiplication of it is definitely going to reach us. It's almost like, oh man, but I lost something. That's why it's painful. You will never attain righteous, righteousness until you give out of that which you love the most. What do people love the most? Benjamin Franklin's face. It's not like he's a good looking guy or handsome or anything like that, right? But he represents something. He represents your wealth. It represents your stature. It represents your you know, societal station, whatever it might be. So when we leave and we give it out of ourselves, it's painful, which is why God says that once you do that, then you've attained some sort of righteousness. You've attained this high spiritual rank, but it's hard to give that. Follow what I'm saying? But with God, when he gives, is it a limitation? There's no limitation. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, it doesn't bother him. There's no sort of limitation to the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a manifestation of the mercy of God is such that when we support others or when we perform a good deed, that good deed can become translatable multiple times and continue to benefit us in this world and in the next. And this brings me then to the last dimension of the discussion. We talked a little bit, uh, for those of you who came late, very briefly about some verses of the Quran that speak to the mercy of God. Secondly, some examples of how God demonstrates or manifests his mercy toward his creation. And thirdly and finally, how can we be amongst those who exemplify the mercy of God in human form to the best of our capacity? First of all, is that even possible? No, it's not possible to manifest truly the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. But at the same time, we have a responsibility to reflect as much as we can in human form, these names and these attributes that God introduces himself. As the famous hadith states from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa act in accordance with the etiquette of God. If God is generous, we have to be generous. If God is just, we have to work toward establishing justice. If God is compassionate, we should seek compassion. If God is merciful, how am I reflecting mercy? And like we know, we take the example of mercy from the most merciful 
and that is the one who was sent as a mercy wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin rasulullah muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam the prophet of mercy who like we know example after example during the course of his life he demonstrates his incredible mercy and through his example it gives us an opportunity to think about the way that we should be acting i'll give you a couple of glimpses and inshallah we'll get to Firstly, in the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Badr, by the way, took place in the month of Ramadan, during the course of the first week of the month of Ramadan, if I'm not mistaken, the fifth or the seventh, maybe somebody knows, 17th, sometime during the month of Ramadan. After the Battle of Badr, it is said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslim army, they had captured some prisoners from the polytheists who waged this battle against them. And the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa ala, out of his mercy, he went to a group of his companions. And he told them, he said, what do you think that we should do to these prisoners of ours, prisoners of war? To which, and again, keep in mind, sixth century, there's wars, battle, right? So on and so forth. One of them said, O messenger of God, imprison them forever. Another man came and said, O messenger of God, kill all of them. To which at that moment, the Prophet them, he looked at them and he looked at these prisoners. And he said, anyone who has any wealth that they can give from amongst these prisoners, anyone who has any wealth that they can give that we can redistribute to the poor, we will take it as a ransom and you will be freed. And there was a, you know, uh, a contingency from amongst them who gave out of their wealth to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa He redistributed that wealth toward the poor, and they were free. And then he said, anyone who doesn't have any wealth but knows how to read and write and can teach ten Muslims how to read and write, they will be freed. This was their punishment. Again, see the etiquette and the mercy and that which the Prophet alaihi salam sought to cultivate a community of learning, a community that sought to grow, so on and so forth. And so a group of them, they stood up and they said, oh, messenger of God, or oh, Muhammad, we know how to read and write, and we are happy to teach 10 Muslims how to read and write if you free us. He says, no problem, you are free. And then he looks at the rest of them. He says, do you have any wealth, or are you literate? They said, no. We do not have any wealth, nor are we literate. So the Prophet Ali said, don't worry about it, go, you are free. That's the mercy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam to, the, to, to, to his own enemy. And we see the mercy of the messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to the other creations of God. And that famous anecdote is said that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa is asleep in his mosque. When he wakes up from his sleep and he sees that there is a cat, a stray cat that had fallen asleep on his sleeve. He was wearing these long garments as they do in the Arabian Peninsula. And as he realizes that this cat is sleeping on his sleeve, he realized that if he were to move his hand, that the cat was going to wake up. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he began to unstitch the shoulder sleeve so that he can slide his arm between the sleeves so that the cat would not awake. At that moment, a man, he enters into the mosque and he says, like, oh, messenger of God, like, as he's watching the prophet unstitch his clothes and trying to, you know, slide his hand through. He says, oh, messenger of God, you are the head of state. You are the representative of God on earth. You are this, you are that. What are you, why are you ripping your shirt? He says, because this cat, I don't want to wake it up. It's sleeping so comfortably. He says, oh, messenger of God, it's a cat. Who cares? He says, that cat is a creation of God, just like you. And it deserves respect and it deserves to be comforted in the same way as you and I. I swear to God, if you can bring me a better example of humanity than our messenger Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, tell me, and I'll sign up for that religion any day. Find me a man who resembles the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Again, a man who his own enemies would testify to his mercy and to his compassion and to his justice. And all of the creations of God would also do the same. When we take a look at 
the way that he emanated and illuminated this beauty. These days and nights are an opportunity for us to ask internally within ourselves. How can I be a bit more merciful? How can I illuminate a little bit of that to those around me, to my family, to my friends, to my community, be it a kind word or a generous donation or something that is seemingly small, like a gift or a smile, which is why, like we know in our religion, we are told that even a smile is a manifestation of charity which should be rewarded by God. Smile, because we know how much that means. It's been a long time since we gather in gatherings like these ones. And the opportunity for us to make this experience a positive one by acting positively and mercifully and caring with others can go a really long way. And I say that because when you see all of these volunteers over the last couple of days exhausting themselves and serving uh, food and you know, distributing dates to everyone, they make sure that everyone eats before they eat themselves. And it hurts when some of them have come to us and said that there are people who are speaking poorly to us, or they're not treating us well, or they're asking us, you know, how come I can't go up and get a second round of food when they themselves haven't eaten yet? That's not the mercy that we want to start to cultivate within our community, within our hearts, within ourselves. When the Prophet ﷺ says that the smile is charity, it doesn't mean a smile that is just made in passing. It means something that stems from our heart and our soul that really shows a sense of care and compassion to others. Where you have the opportunity to say things like please and thank you, again, to where these were working really, really hard around you, do that. Where you can be a little bit more patient because patience itself is a manifestation of mercy, then do that. Understand that everyone is seeking and trying to do their best in service. Because again, we see service also as a manifestation of mercy. But then beyond that and beyond the space, during the course of these days and nights within the holy month of Ramadan, we need to again look internally to see what small steps that we can take, again, toward illuminating and manifesting the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reflecting the mercy of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam recognizing, again, the incredible impact that that, that that can make in the heart of one person, and then how that can potentially transform our communities, our families, and all of society through that one little bit of input that you put in, you'll see the result and the illumination and the magnanimity or the blessing and the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon us, to forgive all of our sins and our transgressions, and to make us amongst those who reflect and walk in the footsteps of our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa alayhi wa tayyibin al-tahirin.